irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to Peace Fund Radio with Ethan Denmeyer and Adrian Paul. Right here on LA Talk Radio. So school's back in. Yes. Uh, I, I took my daughter this morning to um, her first day of kindergarten. And uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting, you know, watching, you know, the separation issues mothers have with their daughters. Yeah, how'd that go? It, it was interesting for, you know, it was, it was, it was, she loved being there. She was looking around trying to figure things out. She had a couple of friends in the, um, in the class mm-hmm. uh, from another school that she was at. And, uh, you know, my wife was a bit teary and. And so was another guy, and I saw another woman doing the same thing. <laughs> it's yeah. a separation. Sorry. I actually, I actually had one. Did that happen with you when when you took Sean to, to, to kindergarten? Oh yeah, did, yeah, did. it was a big step. I mean, she loved it, but uh, it's you know, it's it's tough. It is tough. Yeah, it is tough for moms. I mean, you don't really realize it really as a guy. You know, I mean, it's you know, it's not just tough for moms. I mean, it was hard for me actually. It, it is, isn't it? It's kind of it's it's weird because they're not really going anywhere, or they're just stepping up in life to a different you know. You know, it's the Position. it's one of those steps where it's out of your hands somewhat. It is, isn't it? And you realize it's like the first of many steps where they are stepping away. They're now going to be in the custody of a teacher for several hours. They're going to be impressionable uh, with other adults around, and it just kind of it becomes a different sort of dynamic. Yeah, it does. It's it's, it's suddenly uh, your little girl, your little boy's growing up. Yep, <laughs> it's, it's, and it happens so fast. I know. Yeah, it really does. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I kind of look at it and go, "Wow, what happened?" I mean, I'm five and a half years now, and I'm like, uh, and I look at it sometimes, and and you, you got to look at your kids. You got to look at them, and they're like, "Oh my God, they're five and a half. Oh, they're ten. Where did those five years go?" Right. Even now, I mean, my son too. He's three, and he's all over the place. And I look at it, some of the things he does, and the milestones that they go through is is really kind of. Uh, it's it's kind of enlightening because you, 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 well, did you ever re- remember going through when you when you were like five or six or seven? You know, can you, how far back can you remember? I mean, I can remember till about six. I remember my six. first day of kindergarten, and I remember from my perspective, it wasn't really a big deal. I remember going to my class, and I remember being mystified that my French teacher uh, on the first day didn't speak any English, did the entire class in French <laughs> and I remember thinking I w- remember wondering if she actually spoke any English uh, that's the mind so of wait a minute she was, she was French she did, you did it in French she did the entire class in French was it was it a French class or was it a French school? Or? Um, do we have to start this show over? Because I got a feeling that somebody's really distracted <laughs> no, by no, uh, no. the situation they're going through in kindergarten. Yes, it was my French teacher. Um, and that was the thing that amazed me in kindergarten because she did the whole class in French. And I remember thinking they're going, going home and going to my mom and going, I, I don't think my French teacher speaks any English. <laughs> you know? Yeah, because actually, my does, my daughter's in a French immersion school, so that's why I was oh, kind good. of asking. That's why I was asking that, and you know, they speak French ninety percent of the day. So, um, uh, wow, yeah, um, so it's a whole different. You know, not only is she going to a new school, it's an entirely different language. Mm-hmm. But uh, I mean, I speak to her in Italian. She kind of replies in Italian. So I wanted to 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 grow into speaking two or three languages. Well, that that will happen in your household, which will be great. Um, well, you know, we, we've talked about this before on the show that you know children that go and and, and have to deal with mathematical problems or or language uh, skills, they mm-hmm. actually are allowed to to connect the left and right cortex of the brain, which allows them to learn things a lot better because that cor- those two cortices, if it's after age ten or eleven or twelve, they start doing that. Is that the reason for uh, um, uh, your? Uh, is that the reason? The for reason you? that I'm actually putting you into a French school? You mean? I mean, no, is that the reason they say kids who speak different languages excel? Possibly, yeah. I mean, that's that's one of the reasons. It's not only languages. It's also, um, as I said, mathematical complex problems of that nature that they're constantly doing that. Mm-hmm. It, there's a there's a literally a chemical uh, reaction that happens between the left and right cortexes of the brain that connect, and that allows you to learn and get things better. And possibly, you know, maybe that's that's what you're talking about, about children excelling. Some of you didn't know that, and I didn't know that until, you know, Actually, a mutual friend of ours, Mark Ryan, told me that uh, many years ago. So I think it's very interesting. Anyway, uh, we are in Children in Need. We've got our second 
annual Peace Farm Poker Tournament. For those of you who haven't seen anything about it, it's uh, coming up September 26th. We've already got 30 celebrities signed up. We've got more coming. Um, my uh, friend uh, Kristana Loken's coming. We've got uh, we've got a bunch of people. It's, it's really a lot of fun. Um, I went to Kelly Who's uh, poker tournament last weekend, last week, which was a lot of fun uh, for Best Buddies. Best Buddies is a great organization. It actually helps um, physically challenged, physically and mentally challenged um, uh, individuals find jobs and, and uh, a space in, the, in our society, which I think is an awesome uh, organization. Um, but uh, Kelly's not going to make the poker tournament, unfortunately. Like, you know, last year she in our in our um, um, in our venue, we actually have people being able to donate for people, so people online can donate to the players there. So if you want to follow a celebrity and you want to help them win, you can donate, and they get chips on the table. Walk me through how that works. All right, so you're a player, you're a celebrity, and you tweet out to your fans, oh my goodness, I'm running out of chips, I need more chips, or before the, sh- before the thing, support me, support the Peace Fund, and get me a donation. So somebody puts in $25, $50, it goes into their kitty, and from that kitty, the amount of money that it costs for 2,000 chips or 3,000 chips, they can then take from that kitty and put it on the table. So, so let me see if I understand this. You're playing poker, mm-hmm. and I'm just kicking back watching it, uh, you know, in an office somewhere in the country. And, and you're getting killed at the poker table. Um, and you go, I'm down to my last 10 chips. Can someone donate? I can donate what is about like $1,000 in real money and get you $1,000 in chips. No, you get more than that. Because it's actually only for us. It's only like sixty dollars gets you two thousand chips. Oh. So somebody can get you know. I'm already as- confused. Uh, so uh, so I don't even know what my my do- does it break it down for me? What my let's just say I've got a. So what I give you isn't exactly what you get. No, you get more for it actually. So you get more for it because every some every rebuy ratio that takes the chips all you've got all you've got to, all you've got to worry about is actually donating. As you donate, you fill that player's coffer. In other words, that coffer and that coffer for them would be two thousand chips is sixty dollars. So sixty dollars in real money gets them two thousand chips. Okay, so I do that, and then you get the chips. Correct the on the piece table. One gets the donation. Correct. The player okay. gets the chips, and the piece one gets the donation. So everybody wins, and then you can also watch them online because we're going to be streaming live online. We're going to have interviews with the with the celebrities. They're going to be going out online. We're going to tweet it live. We're going to be having periscopes, so you can actually get a thank you from the celebrities and the people that are playing. So we're going to have a lot of interaction between online people and people that are actually going to be playing on the, on the day. So it's, and we're going to have a Peace Farm Radio uh, uh, broadcast as well, right? Um, well, I imagine there'll be some kind of broadcast, yeah. Well, there you go. Well, I mean, there's going to be, yeah, something. But anyway, that's what we're doing. And, and this year, uh, we're going to highlight a couple of different partners, um, you know, who we have supported and some of the, the monies will go towards these different partners. And... Um, uh, one of them is uh, Mercy and Sharing, a non-profit on the ground in Haiti uh-huh. that's making a difference in the lives of many young kids there. We've supported them with uh, their um, orphanage that is there that uh, houses uh, the last, uh, my last count, I think it was 100 and, well, actually we'll ask them, it was 120 children, I think it was 100, 120. Um, we'll have Mercy and Sharing's Christine Kingan and Carol Fabian joining us by phone today. Um, we can contact them in a second, but I just want to give you some, some uh uh, stuff about Haiti uh, of all the nations in the Western Hem- Hemisphere, none has had. I mean, there are greater challenges to improve the lives of children because of the poor development indicators. It's the most affected by HIV/AIDS outside of the sub- Saharan Africa. Uh, it has dramatically affected the well-being of children who who are healthy and are compromised by poverty and inadequate access to basic health care. L- last year, we actually partnered with Microsoft to send. Uh, uh, hygiene kits to Haiti and um, we delivered those but the basic needs 78% of Haitians are poor they get less than two dollars a day and more than half that's 54% live in extreme poverty of less than one dollar a day so half the children are under five are malnourished over seven percent of children die at birth so the, the numbers are quite staggering you know 80 of a thousand Haitian children never see their first birthday so the, the, there are some, um, you know, conditions there that really need to be sort of addressed. And um, Mercy and Sherry have been there since uh, since the earth, well, actually since before the earthquake, I believe. But we'll talk to them in a second. Um, do you want to? Should we bring them on? Uh, yeah, I can try to bring them on right now. Okay. So while while Ethan's getting hold of them, 
Here's a few more facts for you. 30% of primary school children, uh, of primary school age children are not enrolled in school. Only 15% of teachers at the primary level have basic teacher qualifications. So there are a lot of issues in Haiti that uh, we'll We're find out about. Marcy and Sharon, this is Hannah. Hi, good morning. Is Christine Kingan and Carol Fabian there? Yes, let me get you to them right now. Hold on one second. Thank you very much. See, we get through to the... Uh, to the uh, switchboard. Oh, and we get, nice. we get nice, nice music to come through with it. Should I even turn this down? It sounds so fantastic. Oh, there you go. And then we get actually through to them that way. Uh. See, this is the the, the, the the things of modern technology. You can actually get through them anyway. Hello? Hi there. It's Carol and Christine at Mercy and Sharing. Hello, ladies. How are you? <laughs> Whereabouts are you this morning? We are in Carbondale, Colorado. Carbondale, Colorado. So, so what? Um, you've got a bunch of programs. We've, we've, I've talked with you uh, numerous times, uh, privately, and a couple of times on the phone. I've, I've talked to um, uh, different representatives, and we've we've worked with you for two, three years now, four years now. And uh, but you've got different programs going on, and they're changing all the time. So, can you tell us what you guys have been doing? Oh, absolutely. Um, our, our newest program and one that we're really excited about kicking off is our um, Mothers Keep Your Children Public Service Announcement Program. Um, I know that in the past you talked to Susie a little bit about some of the things that occur in Haiti um, where, you know, desperate families who are having a very hard time caring for their children are approached on the street by representatives from orphanages who promise to take their child, educate their child, care for their child, and then at the end of all of that education, the, the families will get their children back, and they give the, the mother, you know, $100 or $150, which is a lot of money in Haiti, um, and they tell them, you can come visit, here's money to come visit your child, and you can see them anytime you want. And what happens is they uh, they never see their children again. Uh, those children are um, adopted out at around forty five thousand dollars profit to that orphanage. So we're working very hard at letting women know um, not to fall for this sort of things to keep their children, and that we, uh, as Mercy and Sharing Haiti Children, are there to help them. Um, Many of these women have, you know, aren't able to feed their children or send their children to school, and and we can help them with education. We can help them um, with feeding centers. If if they have children with special needs, we have therapy center um, that is state of the art, uh, and we can we can help uh, with rehabilitation and therapy for their children so that they can go on to lead a productive life. Let me ask you a question because, I mean, this is the solution. This is a semi-solution to the problem because the basic problem is shouldn't these orphanages be stopped from doing this type of thing? And is there not any government man mandates that are actually saying, no, you guys are not allowed to do this and you get fined or you get put in prison for selling children away? Or is, or is, or is there some other issue that is that is prevalent that we don't know about? Well, Haiti is a very, very corrupt um, country, and it's very hard for the government um, to control these unlicensed orphanages, um, and oftentimes there's, again, going back to the corruption, um, there's really no way to regulate who's doing what, and, and it's sad. So how did how does somebody you know you, you're a mother you live on one dollar or two dollars a day which we we've, we've just highlighted um, and you get offered one hundred and fifty dollars to put your children or your child somewhere how do you regulate whether or not this orphanage or this person that's actually talking to you uh, is valid or not is there any sort of uh, ID or anything that they can pr uh, show is it and and once this is done I mean the other issue is. Once you're a mother and you've given your child away and suddenly you go back to the orphanage and say, well, the child's gone, bye-bye, what can they do? Yes. Yeah, well, exactly. They can't do anything. And, you know, you, you have to realize, too, that, um, you know, the majority of the population in Haiti lives in abject poverty. Most are illiterate. Um, and 
they there is no way to they don't have any way to check. So that's why these public service announcements are so important um, that we let women know that they should keep their children. There are are other alternatives in terms of being able to feed them and educate them and um, provide therapy for them and not to give their children away because with all the corruption in Haiti, there is no regulation for unlicensed orphanages. There, there's just, it doesn't exist. Let me ask you another question, which is, uh, again, the next step of this, because these are healthy children that these orphanages are, are taking, but then, then you have disabled or special needs children. They're often just thrown away and Correct. left close to death. What, what happens to them? I mean, I know you, you, and this is one of the things I really admire about you, you, you take all children into your, into your facilities and, and help them grow. So what, what happens with these children? Yes, we do. And um, we are the only orphanage in Haiti that will take children with special needs. It's very expensive to, to raise and care for a child with, with any kind of special need. And because medical care is so um, unavailable to poor people in Haiti, many women give birth at home, you know, on a dirt floor, in a one-room shack, and there's a lot of uh, birth traumas. We see a lot of cerebral palsy. Women get no prenatal care. They can't afford a doctor. Um, so oftentimes, children are born with disabilities that have resulted in lack of prenatal care. And um, sadly, you know, if you understand Haitian culture, it's uh, voodoo is a national religion in Haiti. And in voodoo culture, a child with a disability or any person with a disability is considered a curse on the family. And oftentimes these families will just abandon their children, sometimes at a hospital, sometimes it's it's far worse in the woods. They just they get rid of them. They throw them away um, because it's uh, it, 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 the the families are ostracized. We have rescued children with disabilities who were in cages. Uh, one was in a pig pen being raised with you know uh, the family's food source. Oh um, and we recently just brought a beautiful little girl home to our orphanage. Um, I was lucky enough to be there in May. Her name is Marta Livia, and we got a an email from a physician who works uh, for a project called the HME Project, Haiti Medical Education Project. Um, and she was there. What they're doing is they're helping to rebuild the medical school there because when the earthquake hit, they had all these medical students, um, and Haiti desperately needs doctors. The earthquake destroyed the medical school, and now these people who are going on to have careers in medicine were just left with nothing. So this physician's there to help change that and bring some sustainability to the medical services in Haiti. She was um, she was touring a hospital in Capation, and she was going through the pediatric ward and saw this little child, this little girl, who was so close to death. Um, I don't know if you've ever been with someone who's dying, but they have this very distinct respiratory yes. sort of gasping for yes. breath. And um, this Marta Livia was in that place. She was just moments away from dying. And this wonderful physician um, immediately started an IV on her, got hydration, got fluids, put together the money between herself and her colleague to pay for the care because this child had been abandoned there at the hospital, and I, the hospital won't provide any care for these children. They will take them in. If they have a bed, they'll put them in that bed. They may end up under a desk, in a corner, in a hallway. They're not fed. They're not given medication. They're just left there to die unless someone pays for it, and that's just the reality of Haiti. So she, um, this physician, put out feelers and tried to get different orphanages to take this child, and um, everyone turned her down, and she was able to get our name sort of through the grapevine. Within a week, we were up in Capation, got her stabilized, 
brought her back to Port-au-Prince, hired one of our mothers, who we call, that take care of our children, to sit with her in the hospital to ensure that she got the proper medical care. And I was fortunate enough to be the one to go to the hospital in Port-au-Prince um, to just kind of do an assessment and see if she was healthy enough to come home to us in at our orphanage in, in Williamsburg, which is about an hour outside of Port-au-Prince. And she's a perfect success story. You know, when I got there, it was, she was five years old, we think. We don't know. Um, she was so weak. Her eyes were rolled back in her head. She was just this tiny little, about the size of a two-year-old. And, um, you know, I... I tried to pick her up, and her head just fell back. She was so weak, and I thought, man, you know, it's going to be a while. She's not going to be ready to come home for a while. And after about 20 minutes, I got her up, and I started, you know, kind of trying to do an assessment about what her disability was. She's got cerebral palsy, and she's blind, although we didn't know she was blind at the time. And by the time about 20 minutes went by, this child was sitting by herself without support, um, totally blossomed into a whole different child. She needed human touch. Um, I don't know the last time anyone had held her or cared for her, and she just came alive. And there's, there's a condition called failure to thrive, which can happen when children are not nurtured. And I truly believe she was dying because of that. But the good news is she is with us now. She's gained about 10 pounds. She's still small, but she's uh, she's coming along. She's going to therapy every day. She's going to school. She's eating, and she's just a, our beautiful success story. You know, it's, it's interesting because I, I, I've when you're talking about human touch, um, when we put in a um, a respiratory unit in a hospital in uh, in uh, Hungary, I, I was there and and watching the nurses give the 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 care and the love that they gave to the children who were in need it was the human touch not so much the equipment that actually made them thrive in, even more and i think that's something we have to understand as humans humans really need that basic uh, family uh, feeling or, or even just a touch or a hug or uh, you know you see these free hugs you, th you think it's ra rather funny but in a sense that's what we need as as, as uh, adults or as human beings and I think that's something that children need desperately that sometimes we as, as mothers and fathers don't give Absolutely. enough Absolutely Adrian I have to tell you every time I go to Haiti and I walk onto the campus the children pour out of the orphanage and you've got about 12 monkeys hanging on you. You can barely walk. These kids crave the love and the attention of adults, and it's just the most uplifting thing you can imagine. So tell me what happens at, at the orphanage. I mean, you have, you have children that you bring in at a young age, and then you obviously feed them, you clothe them, you educate them. And I know that we've, we've, we've sponsored a, a, a couple of the children, uh, or more than a couple there, um, what what is their program? How do, how do, how do you develop them? How do they leave school? What, what happens in in the process? Well, we actually right now um, we've got three schools, and so we are this year going to be preparing the thirteenth grade to go on to university. So we're really excited about that. Um, we are hoping that they are going to be able to go to the universities in Cuba. We've developed a relationship with the Cuban ambassador and are hoping um, to bring these qualified students over there. We want all of our kids from Mercy and Sharing to become productive leaders in Haiti. That And you have, you have other things that they, they do as well. I mean, the... I mean, I believe education is one of the key things to stamping out poverty and, and racism and, and these things because once you have knowledge, you don't have fear. And, and those things are go hand in hand with absolutely everything that we live our lives by. So well, what else do, does, does Mercy and Sherry give out? I mean, I, know you have, I see you've got month, monthly yoga programs and you've got a soccer team that's uh, you've got your first away game this, this weekend that's scheduled as well. We do. We're really excited about that. The boys are going to be playing their second game um, this Saturday. We, uh, we just recently started our yoga, meditation, and breathing program. So we do monthly yoga classes, which is really making a difference um, in the kids' lives. 
And we're just, you know, really trying to prepare them to be really high-functioning, productive leaders in the Haitian communities. Um, we've got greenhouses on property where the kids are out helping to grow the vegetables that they're going to be eating. We um, do, you know, monthly workshops for the community. So we open up our doors to the community of Williamson to come in and, and take part in some of our workshops. Our next workshop that our pastor is doing is on entrepreneurship, teaching them, um, kind of giving them guidance and letting them know that, hey, they can go out and start their own business. So we are really um, trying to be a, a community center for not only our kids, but for the surrounding community as well. And another thing that Mercy and Sharing offers is our technical and trade school, where we are teaching young adults the skills they need to go out and make a living. We do a um, agricultural program, accounting, sewing, and um, just recently started a program where we're training physical therapy assistants. So, so the one of the last things I want to ask you is obviously this is costs money. I mean, and and you have different programs that cost different things. Can you just outline some of the things that uh, I know what they are? But um, can you outline for our, our listeners what? sort of programs cost for a child uh, and what sponsors and what's, what your students actually need? Well, you know, just to give you an example, our Learning Academy, which is our school that's on our Williamson campus, we educate 258 students, including all of our kids, but also children from the village. And this is a free education that we offer, but it does our annual budget is 113000 to offer this education to the kids. So we are in desperate need right now as we are getting ready to go back to school to get some sponsorships. Sponsorship um, to sponsor a student for one year is just $35 a month, and that will cover all of our educational needs for that one student. So we, um, so you know, we're always looking for educational sponsorships. It's about four hundred dollars a year, right? For yep, just a little over four hundred dollars a year can educate a student. And then also, um, we're also in desperate need to find sponsors for the children who live with us in in our orphanage. The cost is about six thousand dollars per child per year to to raise these children. So there's a lot more information on our website about that, but we have 130, 132 children. And, and I found out yesterday we're likely in the next week or so going to have three more. So, and, you know, in addition to all of that, we have feeding programs and clean water um, programs, and all of it costs money. And, um, you know, the, the thing to know about Mercy and Sharing is that 100% of donations goes directly to Haiti. The board of directors covers all administrative costs. Um, it's the most transparent organization I've ever been involved with. Well, ladies, you do an awesome job. I hope we can uh, incorporate some of this in our Peace Fund Poker Tournament um, that's coming up in uh, se uh, September 26 and help you out a little bit there. Um, that would be awesome. You know, we're, um, we're dedicated in, obviously, protecting, educating, or aiding children, and you guys kind of encompass all those uh, th those parts of our mission statement. So, um, you know, I, I, hopefully we can talk, uh, talk a little bit more after the show and start getting some of the info together so we can actually promote you a little bit more. Um, thank you for joining us this morning, and, and uh, please continue your work. I think it's a fantastic what, what you're doing uh, for the children right. in Haiti. Thank you, and and don't forget, we're going to take you up on uh, on your idea of coming down to play soccer with the kids. See, I know you have a a big soccer background. Yeah, I do. I was, you know, while you were talking about that, I was like, yeah, because I was actually went to my daughter's school this morning. I was like, they've got a kind of soccer program. I'm like, maybe I could volunteer to actually coach some soccer there or something. That'd be kind of fun. That, so that maybe would I'll, be awesome. Maybe you know, we want our kids to to have the lives that every other kid gets to have, and to be able to go out and play soccer or go to yoga. And and, and these kids have such a hard life that no. No child should have to endure to just to bring things like a soccer program in means everything right well thank you i will definitely um uh, figure out some time to come over and do that um, okay but uh we'll, we'll be in touch and uh continue the good work all right thank, thank you, so, you much. so much thank you you're so welcome so uh john are you still there 
I am. Good morning, Adrian and Ethan. How are you guys this morning? Good morning, John. Did you listen to all that? It's amazing when when you just kind of sit there. I mean, we have issues in the United States, and yet, you know, there's so many issues around the world, and and there are some great people out there really doing some amazing work. And I think, uh, you know, know, to put kids through school and also help them with medical supplies and and, uh, food and shelter, and that is is a, a big job. Well, we're actually getting ready to talk to someone else who does exactly that. And it's always exciting when we have Mercy and Sharing on the show. Let me go back to them for a second. They were on our very first episode back on December 5th of 2012. Mark Ryan was in the studio, and Lewis Fawcett from Mercy and Sharing called in and talked about Ingrid, who was one of the first orphans that we, that we, the, the Peace Fund provided assistance to. And I think one of the big reasons that the Peace Fund partnered with Mercy and Sharing is that we knew from the beginning that they provide something beyond food and shelter and medicine. They also have the educational background and the vocational school to teach these orphans the skills that they need to build their own lives and their own careers. So that's why I thought that this would be a perfect morning to talk to a young woman who's doing the same thing on the other side of the world in India. Uh, back on our July 22nd show, we told you about a hero of the week named Ruchita Zaparde who founded So A Future at soafuture.org. That's S-E-W-A-Future.org to provide widowed women in India with sewing machines to weave self-sufficiency, opportunities, and educations for themselves and for their children. And Ruchita is going to be joining us here in uh, just a few seconds to talk about why she started that mission and what's next for her organization. And just like Mercy and Sharing, she has been boots on the ground in India herself and seen firsthand the living conditions of some of these uh, widows and their children and also to be a part of the uh, the solution for that as well. Uh, we could probably try getting hold of her. Do, do we have she's already on the line. Oh, she's she's actually calling in right now. Oh, she's calling in right now. Wow. That was, that was called. Uh, do we have her yet? Ruchita, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, hello. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Were you listening to us? We didn't know. <laughs> How are you doing this morning? I'm great. I'm great. So we heard about a uh, so future after you visited India with your family. How, how old were you then? Mm-hmm. Uh, I was 12 years old when um, I visited India that time. And, and what brought your family to India? Um, actually, my dad grew up in a small Indian village. And on that trip, we had decided to, you know, visit and see where Dad had grown up. Uh, so that's why we were in India. So, so when you went there, I mean, I, I understand there was a lady called Asha who, who who started you on your path. Can you tell me a little bit how you met her and, and, and why? Sure. Um, so on the way to the village that my dad had grown up in, we had happened to stop at a remote village where I met Asha. Asha was a 27-year-old widow with two young daughters with two young daughters. She told me her story of how she'd been taken out of her in-law's home within a month of her husband's death and suddenly had nowhere to go. She started working on a farm as a laborer during the day and stitched clothes by hand at night to earn a living. Her daughters had to quit school so they could hold small jobs to make ends meet. Fighting tears, Asha told me who she dreamed of sending her daughters back to school. She didn't want them to be forced to live lives like her. So is this what happens with a widow? I mean, in, in, the life of a widow and children in, in, in India, is that, is that the kind of the, the, the way they live their lives now uh, as widows? Is that what happens yeah. to them? Yeah. Um, widows in India are blamed for their husband's death. They are often kicked out of their in-laws' homes and left to care for their young children with little or no money. They're shunned and isolated from society and have no job prospects and are often forbidden from remarrying. Their lives are extremely, extremely difficult. You know, you know who started that? It was a man that came up with that idea, obviously, because you know, to, to do that to somebody, whether it's a, human, it's a human being, whether it's a man or a female, is just disgusting. I'm sorry, but you know, it's, it's a backward mentality, and I'm, I'm, it really annoys yeah. me when I hear that type of thing. Um, how and when did you decide to give Ash a, 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 a sewing machine? After I heard Asha's story and I saw her tears, I mean, I had never met someone who, you know, really had nothing. And I knew that I I had to do something. I really wanted to help her. So after I returned to New Jersey, that's where I live, uh, I fundraised at my school. And on my next trip to India, I gave Asha a sewing machine. 
Okay. How, first of all, how much is a sewing machine and how did you get it to India? Did you take it there or did you actually buy one while you were there? Right. Um, so it costs about $110 to give a sewing machine to a family and I buy the sewing machines in India. So you buy them in India. So you, you don't give them the money. You buy the sewing machine and give them the sewing machine. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a much smarter choice because uh, mm-hmm. money can get misappropriated sometimes when you just give money. What? Let me let me ask you another thing here. What's your process of identifying a woman that, that, that is in need and, and somebody that you're going to give a sewing machine to? So a lot of the times it's just, you know, um, visiting villages and talking to the people there, seeing who, who, you know, if there's a widow in the village who could really benefit from getting a sewing machine, you know, if it would really change her life, turn it around completely. Um, another way that we find widows is that widows that we've given sewing machines to already, you know, will get in touch with me and will tell me there's this one widow in a neighboring village and she could really use this. So what are some of your best success stories and how many women do you think you've helped so far? So far, we have um, pulled 237 families out of poverty. And some of my favorite success stories would be um, when I met this woman uh, named Chanda. She was a 26-year-old widow whose husband had committed suicide after he was unable to pay off his debt, and she was left with nowhere to go. Chanda and her two daughters were forced to move in with her aging parents. Alone, she needed to support five people by herself. These days, after we were able to give her a sewing machine, uh, her parents watch her kids while she sews clothes for more than 15 hours a day to support her family. Another person that, um, you know, so a future helped was Rocky, a girl who lost her father in a car accident and had to leave school to help her mother work on a farm. Her mother often had to help Rocky complete her work because Rocky was not used to doing a farm, was not used to doing farm work. She was a student. The day we gave her mother a sewing machine, you could feel Rocky's excitement. She was absolutely thrilled. Rocky understood that she finally had a chance to go to school, learn, and follow her dreams. So how many years have you been doing this, Rachida? Uh, I've been working on So Future for five years now. And, and has your organization grown? How do you, how do you fundraise? How, what, what's, what's, what's your structure? Sure. Um, so my organization has definitely grown over the last five years. Uh, to date, we have involved over 57 schools across the U.S. That's over 1,400 students in our cause. Um, and the schools that schools and students that I get in touch with, they I present so a future to them and talk about Asha's story and you know help them understand how lives of villagers are so different than our lives here in the United States. And they fundraise in their schools, and from there, I'm able to buy these sewing machines and give them to needy widows in India. What's, I mean, you, you talked about schools. Can you sort of highlight a little bit more about what you do with the schools? How do you go into a school? Do you say, like, I've got, I'm doing this thing in India, and uh, can you guys help me? How, how does it work with the schools that you, you identify? Right. Um, So I do talk to a lot of community service clubs, like key clubs, interact clubs, national honor societies, and, you know, kids that are already interested in doing service work and community service. And over Skype, I will present our, our mission statement to them and tell them about some success stories. And one of the things that they like to do is they ask, they ask me a lot of questions. And, you know, having someone face-to-face answer that really helps them to understand and, you know, really start to think about others. What's the biggest thing you've learned about going through this whole process? I mean, you're doing five years now. I mean, obviously, your, your opinions and your things you've thought about have possibly changed uh, over that time. What's the, what's the biggest thing you think you learned in this process? Um, I think the biggest thing that I've learned is honestly to just keep going. Um, when I'm presenting the So Future cause to schools, 
and I contact superintendents and principals and explain the goals of so future. It's really hard to, you know, bring that to them because they're uh, concerned about students losing focus from their daily academics. So one of the things that I've, you know, found is that it's very, very easy to get discouraged when I don't get a call back from a school or an email and they don't want to work with SOA Future. And I, I think, am I really making a difference? That how can a high school student from New Jersey, you know, create real substantial change from 6,000 miles from home? But one of the things that I remember is the smile on Asha's face when I was giving her that sewing machine and her daughter's joy at the thought of returning to school. Thanks to the efforts of students at a middle school in Long Island in New York, half a world away. And seeing that success that So Future has had, I have come to value the difference that making that taking sorry small steps can make in this world. So what's what's next for you? What what do you what's next for you and your organization? So um in the next couple of years, I aim to spread the word about So Future and also get universities involved. Right now, it's just with elementary, middle, and high schools. Uh, I'm also in 11th grade, and I plan to continue growing So Future during my remaining high school years, in college, as well as beyond that. Well, Rashida, thank you so much for joining us this morning, and uh, congratulations on doing on all this work because I think you know every small p- piece helps around the world because there's so much strife that goes around and uh, people like you and a lot of our heroes of the week that are out there making their part really do make a ripple in the uh, in the pond of life if you like so uh, thank you for doing that and uh, congratulations thank you so much for having me no thank you thank you thank you um, I will hopefully we'll speak to you again yes thank you take care bye 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 so, John, I mean, it's again, this morning we're looking at people that are aiding children, really. I mean, we, our show this is children in need and, and aiding children. Um, what are your thoughts, guys? I mean, this is you know, we've heard a lot of different things this morning, which obviously every, every week we have different topics. And it kind of – you sometimes wonder that how, how can you actually really help all these strife out there? I mean, but, you know, a little bit at a time, I guess. Yeah, well, you know, I think you, I think you said it best yourself, Adrian. It's It's – Maybe one family being helped may be a ripple, but sometimes a ripple can be a really big ripple. Who's to say that one of these, we've talked about this here on the lot, a lot before, who's to say that one of these children who's helped, uh, one of these children who's able to go back to school because Ruchita gave her mother a sewing machine, or one of the orphans who is able to get a job as a computer programmer because Mercy and Sharing was able to send that orphan to a vocational school, that one of those one of those kids might you know, come up with a, a cure for cancer or some sort of huge you know, technological improvement that changes. Who knows? Who knows what could happen? Even if it's just a simple matter of one of these kids saying, you know what, when I was little, someone from half a world of way, away reached out and helped me. So today I'm going to reach out and help someone else. You just you never know what's going to happen because of one child being helped, and that's what I love so much, so much about these stories. Well, uh, Ethan, you've been very quiet through this show. I mean, I see you thinking about a lot of the stuff that's going on. It's it's uh, it's, it's kind of staggering. I think that you know. Well, there's no reason to talk when you've got such a wonderful uh, activist with the platform telling other people and perhaps inspiring other people in things they can do whether it's involved sewing or not, or orphanages or not. So that's, there's not much to say. Well, this, this, uh, this show, for those of you uh, that have just joined us, uh, we talked this morning with uh, uh, Mercy and Sharing, uh, Carol Fabian and Christine Kingan. Uh, Mercy and Sharing, for those of you that want to know a little bit more about them, they're HaitiChildren.com. Um, it was in 1994 when Susie Craybacker made her first trip to Haiti and began helping the people of uh, Cité Soleil um, today, Mercy and Sharing is uh, it's grown to care for over 5,000 people. Um, and it's Haitian registered. It's a non-profit organization. As they mentioned, 100% of their profits go to the programs that they support, which is awesome because, you know, we come across a lot of organizations that their, um, their amounts that they give to charity or for, to run the programs is a lot less than that. In their 20-year history, they've cared for Haiti's most vulnerable children and established a reputation for excellence in 
comprehensive and community-based programming, and we will be you know highlighting them at our poker tournament this year. Um, now, the, uh, the, the for those of you that just joined us, the many many things that the things happen in Haiti. It's been five years since the earthquake. Nearly three hundred thousand homes were badly damaged or destroyed, and mainly because there's no real infrastructure there for. Uh, building codes or anything of that nature. So a lot of it um, that struck near the capital city of Port-au-Prince uh, destroyed most of the important government buildings, hospitals, roads. So with that carnage and, and infrastructure destroyed, there were, it was uh, it was it was rife for widespread poverty and poor construction uh, that uh, that uh, needed to be changed. So. Mercy and Sharon have been there for five years, and today 70,000 people still remain internally displaced at Port-au-Prince and largely surviving tent camps that sprung up after, after the earthquake. So five years, there are 70,000 people still living in tents, and the people like Mercy and Sharon that are there actually on the ground trying to help. There's a lot of stuff, health and nutrition, cholera epidemics, water and sanitation and hygiene, education, child protection. And child protection is one of the hardest ones to keep because, as was highlighted this morning, you know, there are a lot of people um, taking advantage of the poor in Haiti who some live on $2 a day and some earn $1 a day. I mean, one, $1 a day. I mean, how, what, what would you get here? Some water? Not even, you wouldn't even get a bottle of water in, in Los Angeles for that. So, you know, Jeez. even before the earthquake, there was 1.2 million children vulnerable to violence, abuse, and exploitation. And that earthquake's made it even worse. So to address this immediate need, you know, relief organizations established child-friendly spaces where child, children could play and start to regain a sense of normalcy. And like we, we heard this morning, every child deserves the ability to grow up with doing something normal, like playing soccer, like playing baseball, like going to school, like having the right food or sanitation or a bed at night. So these things are very important. And as of 2014, there have been over 85,500 people of 22,741 households that still live in camps since the 2010 earthquake. So these people have to be helped. So as I said, the organization right now that's helping them that we're going to highlight is Mercy and Sharing. And John, I want to any updates you have for us on any other topics. Well, uh, very quickly, I wanted to remind everybody to check out uh, our Hero of the Week's website, Ruchita's site, at uh, soafuture.org, S-E-W-A-Future.org, where you can see photos of Ruchita with many of the widows and their children that she has helped. Um, all of the sewing machines have a plaque on them that shows when the sewing machine was donated, which school and her network raised the funds for it. It's, really, it's a really great website, and you can really see all of her hard work uh, there in action for everything that the Peace Fund is up to, including all of the ways that you can help support the Peace Fund and support Peace Fund Radio, go to thepeacefund.org. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter, two different accounts, The Peace Fund for General Peace Fund Business and Peace Fund Radio for updates specific to the show. Follow Adrian at Adrian Paul one Follow Ethan at Combat Radio. You can also learn about Ethan's Friday show, Combat Radio, where he brings in the biggest names in sports and music and film to talk about the issues that matter to you. And just as a recap, Peace Fund Poker. September 26th, I'll be putting out a flyer. If you can't make it, if you can't join online, spread the flyer out for us. We want the people on the ground. We want the people online to give us the best amount of support that we can get on the day. It's right, peaceonpoker.org. Peaceonpoker. It's funny, you're saying ORG. A lot of people say to me, why are you saying ORG instead of org? But, <laughs> um, but really... Peace Fun Poker. Tomato, tomato. Tomato, Adrian, tomato, exactly. <laughs> uh, that's what I tell people when they tell me that. Um, <laughs> but basically, go to, go, you can, you, you'll see the flyer on peacefunpoker.org. I will be tweeting out the new flyer for it that will explain it. You can also go to peacefunpoker.org and see the videos that are on there explaining hey, if you want to be a sponsor, if you want to be a, a join the, the game, if you want to support a player online. It's all there, very easy to, to view. And, and share this uh, this link for us so that we can actually really have a, a great event and, and you know help some of the kids we re that desperately, desperately need it. Um, John, uh, thank you for uh, joining us this morning. My um, honor, as always. And obviously, Bev Shahara for um, bringing us all that information. Ethan, you know, as usual, you are. And I think you're going to be with us at Peace Fun Poker, aren't you, Ethan? 
Uh, uh, yeah, I'm planning on it. Planning on it. I mean, I know things change, but you know, everybody plans things. I'd like to change. see it work wonderfully well. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we want to. I'd I, like to try to get out there too as well. I don't know if I can, but uh, well, if I can, I'll, I'll be there. That would be awesome, John. I mean, uh, we got. So, are we going to be? Maybe if you have a couple Star Wars guys there. Uh, <laughs> we're, well, you know what? We're, we're garnering a lot of celebs at the moment. As I said, we got thirty right now. We're gonna, and we're still garnering more. And by by another in another month, we could have another ten to fifteen that have joined us that uh, would be very interesting names to have on there, but we'll leave that alone right now. Anyway, um, I will bring you all the updates. Uh, you'll see our Twitter feeds and our Facebook feeds. Please go to either the Peace Fund on Facebook uh, and Twitter or Peace Fund Poker on uh, Facebook and Twitter. And uh, we will leave you this week with a quote by Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. This is Adrian Paul and Ethan Dentmeyer. We'll definitely see you next week. You're listening to Peace Fund Radio with Ethan Dentmeyer and Adrian Paul right here on LA Talk Radio. 